The history of the Yorubas from the earliest time to the beginning of the British Protectorate by Reverend Samuel Johnson. Chapter four, government. The entire Yoruba country has never been thoroughly organized into one complete government in a modern sense. The system that prevail is known as the feudal. The remoter portions have always lived more or less in a state of semi-independence whilst loosely acknowledging an overlord. The King of Benin was one of the first to be independent of the central government and was even better known to foreigners who frequented his ports in early times and who knew nothing of his overlord and then unexplored and unknown interior. Yoruba proper, however, was closely organized and the description here given refer chiefly to it. With some variation, most of the smaller governments were generally modeled after it, but in much simpler form and solely in their domestic affair, foreign affair so far as then obtained before the period of the revolution were entirely in the hands of the central government at Oyo. It should be remembered that the coast tribes were much less important than now, both in population and in intelligence. Light and civilization with the Yorubas came from the north with which they have always retained connection through the Arabs and the Fulanis. The center of life and activity of large population and industry was therefore in the interior, whilst the coast tribe was scanty in number, ignorant and degraded, not only from their distance from the center of light, but also through their demoralizing intercourse with Europeans and the transactions connected with the overseas slave trade. This state of things has been somewhat reversed since the latter half of the 19th century by the suppression of the slave trade and the substitution thereafter thereof of legitimate trade and commerce, and more especially through the labors and commissions who entered the country about the same time as the springing up into being of modern towns of Lagos, Abeyakuta, and Ibada, through which Western light and civilization beam into the interior. The government of the Yoruba proper is an absolute monarchy. The king is more dreaded than even the gods. The office is hereditary in the same family, but not necessarily from father to son. The king is usually elected by a body of noblemen known as Oyomesi, the seven principal counselors of the state. The vassal or king prevent or provincial kings and ruling princes were 1060 at the time of the greatest prosperity of the, in, of the empire, which then included the Popopos, the Diomi, and part of Ashanti with portion of the Tapas and Baribas. The word king, as generally used in this country, includes all more or less distinguished chiefs who stand at the head of the clan or who is the ruler of an important district or province, especially those who can trace their descent from the founder or from one of the great leaders or heroes who settled with him in the country. There are different grades corresponding somewhat to different orders of the king peerage, dukes, marquis, earls, viscounts, and barons, And their order of rank is well known among them. The Onikoyi, as head of Okun Osi, or Metropolitan Province, was the first of these kings. And he it was who used to head all of the oil once a year to pay homage to the Alafin or the king of the Yorubas. The Alafin. The Alafin is the supreme head of all the kings and princes of the Yoruba nation as he is a direct lineage descendant and successor of the reputed founder of the nation. The succession of the above said is by election, 
were among members of the royal family. And the one considered as the most worthy age and nearness to the throne being taken into consideration. It might be mentioned also in passing that the feeling and acceptance of the denizens of the harem towards the king elect was often privately ascertained and assured of previously. In the earliest days, the son naturally succeeded the father. And in order to be educated in all the duties of the kingship, which one must one day devolve upon him, he was often associated more or less with the father in performing important duties. And thereby, he often performed royal functions and there gradually he practiced reign with his father under the title of Aremo. Having his own office residence near the palace, but as the age grew corrupt, the Aremo often exercised sway quite as much, if not more than the king himself, especially in the course of a long reign, when age has rendered the monarch feeble. They had equal powers of life and death over the king's subject, and there are some cases on record of the Aremo being strongly suspected of terminating the life of his father in order to attain full powers at once. It was therefore made a law and part of the constitution that as the Aremo reigned with his father, he must also die with him. This law had an effect at any rate, a check upon parricide. It continued to take effect upon the last century when in 1858, it was repealed by Atiba, one of the later kings in favor of his Aremo Adelu. The Adelu may now succeed if found worthy, but he must be elected in the usual way. But if passed over or rejected by the king's makers, he must leave the city and resort to a private retirement in the province. This, however, is not really obligatory, but as he must be succeeded in his office, such a course is inevitable unless he chooses of his own accord to die with his father. The choice may sometimes fall upon one of the poorer provinces in the quiet pursuit of his trade with no aspiration after the throne. Such a one is sent for and unnecessarily ill-used for the last time to his own surprise. This was done probably for the purpose of testing his temper and spirit. He may not be aware of the intention of the oil messy until he has been admonished by them as to the duties and responsibility of the exalted position he is soon to fill. The nominations are three titled members of the royal family, the Ono Ona Isokun, the Ona Oka, and the Omo Ola, uncles or cousins of the king but generally entitled the king's fathers. These have to submit or suggest the names to the noblemen for election. But the Basoron voice is paramount to accept or to reject. Curious and elaborate ceremonies precede the actual procession to the throne. After all arrangements have been made, the ceremonies begin by a sacrifice brought from the house of Ona Isokun by a body of men called Omo Nimnari. These belong to a family especially concerned in carrying out all menial duties connected with offering of sacrifices and in waiting upon the kings and priests. As soon as they enter the house where the king elect is, he is called out and he has to stand up with an attendant by his side. He is touched on his chest and on the right and left shoulder with a bowl of sacrifice, the attendant in the meantime uttering some form of words. This is the signal that he has been called to the throne. On the evening of the same day, he is conducted quietly into the house of Ona Isokun, where he spends the first night. In order to avoid the crowd, the attention of the populace is usually diverted by a procession of the king's slaves and others which much noise and ado as if 
escorting him, while the king-elect accompanied by the Areg Bedi, a titled eunuch, and a few of the Omo Ninari come up quietly a long way behind. At the Ona Isokun's house, he is attended slowly by the Omo Ninari. He is admonished and advised by those who stand to place to stand to him in the place of his father. Some ceremonies of purification are gone through, but peach toy sacrifices are again offered, which are carried to various quarters of the city by the Omo Ninari. The next night, he passes at the house of Otun Iwefa, the next in rank to the chief of the eunuchs, this officially being a priest of Shango, it is probable that the king-elect spends a night with him in order to be initiated in the sarsodo part of his office, de la fe having as much of a spiritual as a secular work to perform, being at once king and priest to his people, and probably he learns there are also the usage and doings of the huge population in the inner precincts of the palace which with the eunuchs are quite conversant. After this, he is conducted into the chambers in the outer court of the palace of Oile, where he resides for three months, the period of mourning, until his coronation. The main gateway to the palace being close at the demise of the king, a private opening is made for him in the outer walls through which he goes in and out of his temporary residence. During this time, he remains strictly in private, learning and practicing the style and deportment of a king and the details of the important duties and functions of his office. During this period, he is dressed in black and is entitled to use a cap of state called Orikogbe Ofo. The head may not remain uncovered. The affairs of the state are at this time conducted by the Basoran. The coronation. The coronation takes place at the end of three months, really at the third appearance of the new moon after the king's death. The date is generally so fixed as to have it, if possible, before the next great festival. It is attended with a great public demonstration. It is a gala day in which the whole city appears and holiday dress. Visitors from the province and representative of neighboring states also flock into the city in numbers. The day is generally known as the king's visit to the Bara. It is the first and most important act of the ceremonies. The Bara, or royal mausoleum, is, consec is a consecrated building in the outskirts of the city under the care of the high priest named E. Mode. There, the king was formally crowned and there buried. The king enters it but once in his lifetime, and that is at the coronation with the mark of pomp and ceremony. The actual crowning does not now take place in the Bara as, as it seems to have been, but at Koso, the shrine of Shango. But the visit to Bara is so important and indispensable, a preliminary that it has become more closely identified with the coronation than to the other shrines visited on occasion. Leaving the Ipada, the temporary chambers, there are two stations at which the king elect has to halt before reaching the sacred building. The first is the Abata, or the area in front of the palace where the tent of beautiful cloths have been erected for him. Here, he has to change his mourning dress for a princely robe. He then proceeds to the second station at the Aplapini's midway on his route, where a large tent and an enclosure have been erected for his reception. Here, he is awaited by a vast concourse of people and welcome 
with ringing cheers. Here, he receives the congratulations and homage of princes, the nobles, the chiefs, and the people, and is hailed as the king. Some ceremonies are here gone through, also which include distribution of colonets, etc., to the princes and chiefs without. After this, he proceeds to the bara, accompanied by the whole course of people who have to remain outside. He enters the sacred precinct attended by the magaji, Iyan Jin, his official elder brother, the princesses, the Ona Onshe Aro, an official, the Antu Wefa, the next to the chief of the eunuch of the eunuchs, who is a priest, and the omoni nari of a set of servants. There last are to laughter and skins of animals to be offered. There these last are to slaughter and skin the animals to be offered and sacrifice. At the Bara, he worships at the tomb of his fathers, a horse, a cow, and a ram being offered at each tomb. Portions are sent out to each of, to each of the noblemen, princes, and chief waiting outside the Basoram, receiving the first and the lion's share or the whole. He invokes the blessing of his deceased father and is thereby said to receive authority to wear the crown. The visit of the Bara then is for the purpose of receiving authority and permission from his deceased ancestors to wear the crown. Hence it is spoken of as the coronation. It is a fixed rule that the whole of the meat is to be totally consumed at the Bara under no circumstances should any be taken home. This over, the king returns hence with great pomp and show to his temporary chambers amid the firing of feu de joie, the bleeding of a caca, key trumpet and drumming, etc. On the fifth day after this, he proceeds to Koso, the shrine of Shanga, for the actual crowning. Here he is attended by the Otun Wefa, who has the charge of the shrine, the Bale mayor, of Koso, a suburban village, the Omoni, Nari, and the Isonas. The Isonas are the body of men whose sole employment is to do all needle and embroidery work for royalty. They are also the umbrella makers, the crown, robe, staff, and all ornamental bead works and workings in cotton, silk, or leather are executed by them. Surrounded by the principal eunuchs and princes, the great crown is placed on his head, which much more ceremony by the Yakere, who the Yakere is, for whom is reserved this most important function will be seen. The royal robes are put on him, the Ejigba, Round his neck, the staff and the sword of mercy are placed on his hands. On the fifth day after this, he proceeds to the shrine of Orayan. Here, the great sword or sword of justice brought from Ile Ife is placed on his hand, but that which he can have no authority to order an execution. After another interval of five days, he proceeds to the shrine of Ogun, the god of war and there offers a propitiatory sacrifice for a peaceful reign. The offering consists of a cow, a ram, a dog, the last being indispensable to any sacrifice to the god of war. From the shrine of Hakun, the procession goes straight on to the palace, entering now for the first time by the main gate open for him, the former opening through the outer wall, to the temporary chamber being quickly walled up as he enters the palace proper as the king. But as a new opening is made for him at the Kobi Aganju, through which he enters the inner precinct of the palace, this interest or his exclusive use in 
and out of Kobe doing his reign at his death, is, it is closed up. At the entrance, they offer in sacrifice a snail, a tortoise, an armadillo, a field mouse, a large rat, a toad, a tadpole, a pigeon, a fowl, a ram, a cow, a horse, a man, and a woman, the last two being buried at the threshold of the opening on the blood of the victims and over the grave of the last two, he has to walk into the inner court. Human sacrifices, however, now totally abolished were not commonly practiced among the oils, but such immolation was always performed at the coronation and at the burial of the sovereign. By the sacrifices, he is not only crowned king with the power over all man and beast, but he is also consecrated a priest to the nation. His person therefore becomes sacred. All this having been performed, it is now formally announced to the assembled public that King A is dead, or rather has entered into the vault of the skies, Apo Aja, and King B now reigns in his stead. During the interval of the late King Illness, up to the time of his death, the business of the state is carried on normally by the palace officers, the Osi Wefa, personating the king, even to the extent of putting on his robe and his crown and sitting on the throne when such is required. But as soon as it is known that he is dead, the Basaram at once assumes the chief authority and nothing can be done without him. The king having been crowned, he is henceforth forbidden to appear in public streets by day, except on very special and extraordinary occasions. He is, however, allowed evening strolls on the moonlight nights when he may walk about incognito. This exclusion not only enhances the awe and majesty due to a sovereign, but also lends power and authority to his command and is the best safeguard for public order at their present stage of civilization. Besides, it would be very inconvenient to all the citizens if the king were always coming out, for according to the universal custom of the country, whenever a chief is out, all of his subordinates must go out with him. It is an inviolable law and custom of the country, and if applicable to all, whatever their rank. Thus, if the Basaram is out, all the oil messies must also be out. If the ballet of a town is out, all the chiefs of the town must also be out, and if the king is out, the whole city must be astirred and on the move, all business suspended until he returns to the palace. Igba Iwa. At the commencement of every reign, the Igba Iwa or calabashes of divinations are brought from Ile Ife to the new king to divine what sort of reign his will be. Two covered calabashes are of similar shape and size, but with quite different contents are brought, one containing money, small pieces of cloth, and the other articles of merchandise denoting peace and prosperity, the other containing miniature swords and spears and arrows, powder, bullets, razors, knives, etc., denoting war, and trouble for the country. The king is to choose one of them before seeing the contents. And according as he chooses, so will be the fate of the Yoruba country during his reign. The very first official act of the new king after his coronation is to create an Oremo and a princess royal or an equivalent. The Oremo is the crown prince. The term simply denotes an heir, but it is used as the title of the crown prince of oil. The title is conferred upon the elder son of the sovereign in a formal manner. The ceremony, being termed the christening, as the newborn child, hence he is often termed Omo, child, by way of distinction. 
the title of a royal, princess royal is at the same time and in the same manner conferred upon the eldest daughter of the sovereign as well. This, however, is of much less importance than the other. When the king is too young to have a son, or his son is a minor, the title is temporarily conferred upon a younger brother, or next of kin that stands to him in place of a son. But as soon as the son is of age, he must assume his title and begin to act under the guardianship of the eunuchs who are his guardsmen. The method is as follows. Both of them must have a sponsor or father, as he is called, chosen by divination from among title eunuchs. This done, the Aremo repairs to the house of the Ona Isokan to worship at the graves of the deceased Aremos who were all buried there and prince to that of the deceased predecessor and her mother's house, the king supplying them with a bullock each. The whole day is thus spent in festivities. On their return in the evening, they both proceed direct to the sponsor's house where they must reside four days, each day being marked with festivities, the king supplying two bullocks every day and this is further supplemented by the Aremo himself. The feasts are open to the general public. Whoever likes to repair to the house is a welcome guest. Portions are also sent out to the prince and the noblemen and other distinguished personages. At the end of the fourth day, the Aremo invested with the robes of his office and with a coronet is conducted to his official residence where he takes up permanent, his permanent abode. And the princess, usually clad likewise, repairs to her home. Public appearances of the king. The king generally appears in public on three great annual festivals of Ifa, Orum, and the bearer. And two of and two at least of these festivals, that of Orum and the Bere, the Basorum is equally concerned with him. These festivals have certain features in common. Although each has its own marked characteristic, they all they are all preceded by the worship of Ogun, the god of war, and on the third day after the firing of the royal salute and the sound of the ivory trumpet announced to the public that the king may now be seen in state sitting on his throne and all royal subjects who wish to have a glimpse of his majesty now may repair to the palace. The festival of Ifa or Mole takes place in the month of July nine days after the festivals of Shango. The Ifa is the god of divination. One day in a week is generally given to the consultation and the service of Ifa, but an annual festival is celebrated in its honor at oil. The Orun festival takes place in September. At the festival, the king and Basoram worship together the Ori, or god of faith, the Oram, from which it appears the Basoram derives his title and title, his name and title, and is curious, if not father of mystical rites. The word Oram signify heaven. The title in its full is Iba Asoram, i.e., the Lord who performs the Oram or heavenly mysteries. The king and his Asoram are often spoken of as Oba Aye or Oba Oram, i.e. King Terrestrial and King Celestial. And what way his supernatural highness performs the Oram or what position he assumes towards the sovereign in his ceremony is not generally known because it is always done in private. But the rite seems to deal with affairs connected with the king's life 
it is to him a periodic reminder of his coming apotheosis and the emblem of worship is said to be a coffin made of or paved with clay in which he is to be buried. It is kept in charge of the Iyaoba, the king's official mother, in a room in her apartment visited by no one, and the ceremonies are performed in private once a year by the king himself. His mother is Osora, the latter taking the chief apart. Consequently, very little is actually known of the doings of the of these three great personages. But this much is allowed to be known, that the Basorum is too divine with Col this to divine with colonists to see whether the king's sacrifices are acceptable to the celestial or not. If the omen be favorable, the alafe is to give the basoro presents of a horse and other valuables. If unfavorable, he is to die. He has forfeited his right to further existence. But there can be no doubt that under such circumstances, it can always be managed between them that the omens be always favorable. From this and other circumstances, it would appear that the king on this occasion occupies a humiliating position as one whose conduct is under review. Hence, the great privacy observed, for it is a cardinal principle of the Eurobus that the Aliphant, as the representative of the founder of the race, is to humble himself before no mortal. If such a contingency were to occur, he is to die. Hence, no doubt, that his natural mother, if then living, is to make way for her son ascending to the throne, so there will be no occasion to violate any filial duty imperative on a son who is at the same time the king. His majesty must be supreme, even in performing reverential duties before the priests of Shango, when such are required, some privacy must be observed. The Berry Festival takes place in January, towards the end of the year, the new year commencing in March. It is the most important and the grandest of the three. It is primarily the Harvest Home Festival, symbolizing the cer by ceremoniously setting the fields of fire to indicate that it has been cleared by the fruits of the earth. It is important, one at oil, not only because it closes the civil year, but also because it is the king's numbers, the years of his reign. The barrier itself, which seems to be the symbol of so many ceremonies, is a common grass which grows only in the plain country and is used mainly for thatching houses. It is considered the most sumptuous of all materials used for covering houses. It is the coolest, the neatest, the most durable, the lin and lends itself best for ornamental purposes. Consequently, it is highly thought of. The festival proper is always preceded by two important ceremonies, the pakonduring, indicating the beginning, and the jalepa, the end of ingathering. The pakondirin is performed by the onawefa, or chief of the eunuchs, by the basoram, or his representative, and the ab obaku, or master of the horse. The king in semi state appears in the Kobe Aganju to witness the same with several of the ladies of the palace around him. And at the interest of the Aganju, the musician making occasion making the occasion very lively. The king is supposed to not have been had to not have seen the newberry grass of the year. The Onawefa first steps forward before him with a skit made of brass or copper performing in air a mimic act of mowing the grass and one of the ladies in the palace 
deputed for the purpose, extending her wrap as it were to receive the same, hugging it as something precious. It is done two or three times. The basoram then follows and goes through the same forms and then the master of the horses. Each of these chiefs now makes a short speech congratulating the king on the advent of the new year, wishing him a long life and prosperous reign. After this, about half a dozen men with small bundles of the beer grass neatly done up enter the palace with measured steps to the sound of music and come dancing before the king in front of the Abanju. His majesty is supposed to see the new grass for now for the first time that year. The ceremony is brought to a close by the presents given to the men and then all spectators disperse from nine to 17 days are now allowed for harvesting before the fields are set afire. The Jalepa is the ceremony of setting the fields on fire. This is performed by the Basoram outside of the city wall booth and enclosure of palm leaves having been erected for the purpose. The Basoram with a princely train repairs fitter on the appointed day. He is met there by a number of women from the palace bringing a large calabash tray with a white cloth and containing olele, a sort of pudding made of white beans and palm oil and echo, a kind of blanc mange made of soap corn flour, corn and beans, being taken as the staple of life, the principal products of the field. His supernatural highness first offers a morsel of these in sacrifice as a harvest thank offering for the Yoruba nation, after which both himself and those in the market of the rest accompanied with palm wine or beer made from guinea corn, thanking God for the blessing of the field. This over he orders the fields to be set afire, but if by accident the fields have already been fired, a bundle of dry grass brought from home is used instead for the purpose of the ceremony. The firing of a feu de joie now serves to show that a ceremony is over and the parties are returning to the city. This is done in state. The basorum robes in one of the enclosures. He is attended by hundreds of horsemen and footmen, horsemen galloping backwards and forwards before him, and a firing and fiffing of drums are deafening. With such royal procession, his supernatural highness re-enters the city. Of the evening the same day, the king worships the Ogun, which is preliminary to every annual festival. The following day is a very busy one at oil. It is the day of paying tributes of buried grass. The whole of oil messy first sends theirs to the king. The Basorum alone would send about 200 bundles the subordinate chief sends to the senior chiefs, every one of the feudal lords or chief, each man according to his own rank and position and so on to the lowest grades, the young men to the heads of compound, so that it is usual to see loads of berry passing to and fro all over the town the whole day. From the provinces also tributes of Bere come to oil later from the Asegen of Isegen, the Oluijo of Iyo, the Bale of Obomoso, and other cities in the plain where the Bere grows. This being the recognized principal festivals of the Alafe, other town and year of Bere send congratulatory messages with presents or tributes. The Ibadans and their marauding days used to send slaves from Ijesas and Iketi countries 
palm cola nuts, alligator pepper, firewood, and other forest products found near the coast and articles of European manufacture, and so on during this season. The day after being a period of ceremony of Jelepa and the worship of Ogun, the public festival takes place. The king in state. The king generally appears in state on these three festive occasions, facing the large quadrangle of the outer court are the six principal kobis that in the center is what is known as the kobi aganju or throne room where alafe always appears on state occasion. It is always kept close and never used for any other purpose but this. On such occasion, the floor is spread all over with mats and the front of the throne overspread with scarlet cloths. The posts all around are decorated with velvet cloths and the walls with various hangings. The throne or chair of state was made of wood at a time when the knowledge of carpentry was not common in this country. It cannot boast of any artistic merit, and it is highly valued for its solidity, hoary age, and tradition. It is of large size and covered over with velvet. The crown is made of costly beads such as coral, agra, and the like, which in this poor country stands to the people instead of precious stone. It is artistically done by expert with fringes and small multicolored beads depending from the rim which serve to veil the face. The robes are usually silk or velvet of European manufacture which were of much greater value in the early days when intercourse with the coast was not so much common as it is now. The ajikba is the chain of office. This is made of strings of costly beads going around the neck and reaching as far down as the knees. The apa leki is the staff and spectrum and scepter artistically covered all over with small multicolored beads. The irukere is a specially prepared cow sail of spotless white, which the king generally holds in front of his mouth when speaking, but it is considered bad form to see him open his mouth in public. He makes his speech sotto voce and it is repeated to the assembly in a loud voice by the chief of the units. The white tail is moreover an emblem of peace and grace. State umbrellas. Umbrellas in this country are part and parcel of the state paraphernalia. In fact, there was a time when private individuals dared not use an umbrella. That was in the days before chief foreign ones were obtainable. The prohibition was first done away here at Ibadan, where the war boys were allowed to enjoy themselves in any way they liked and use any materials of clothing and ornament they could afford, as it might be only for a few days before they laid down their lives on the battlefield. However, those of a chief are easily distinguished now by their size and quality. They are most always of bright coloring, usually of damask. The size and the number are in proportion to the rank of the chief, usually of European manufacturer now, though there is a distinct family of royal umbrellas makers kept at oil who make those of great large size. Most of the umbrellas, foreign or locally made, are decorated with certain implant indicative of rank. About two or more are used on these festive occasions. Music. The Kobe 
third or fourth to the uh, ganju is occupied by the musician. The musical instrument consists of almost every description of feet, trumpet and drums of which the ivory and kakaki trumpets and uh, ogi digbo drum are peculiar to the sovereign. The king in throne is surrounded by his favorite wives, one of whom are Ore Ori Ite holds a small silk par parasol over his head from behind as a canopy. About 30 or 40 female Ilaris with costly dress and velvet caps on are seated on the scarlet cloth on the right and on the left in the throne left of the throne, but in open air under large umbrellas, one on either side, a wide space being left between them. Then there is a row of about 10 large umbrellas, each on the right and the left, both rows facing each other, leaving a wide avenue between from the throne to the main entrance, other and that those on the right are seated, the crown prince supported by all the princes and principal eunuchs. Under those on the left are the younger eunuchs, the Ilaris, the Tetus, and other palace officials. Behind these, on either side, are the crowds of spectators. At a considerable distance in front of the throne, in the avenue left between the two stands the Basarama and the rest of the oil messi um, to do homage. This is done by taking off their robes, wrapping their cloths around their heads, their waists, leaving the body bare. Three times they have to run to the main entrance gate, sprinkle earth on their heads, and on their naked bodies run back halfway towards the throne, prostrating themselves on the ground, on the stomach, and on the back. Then follows the customary oration from the throne, the king speaking in a hushed tone with the Irukere in front of his mouth and his chief of eunuchs, who with his lieutenants, the Otam of Osifwa, is standing midway between the throne and the noblemen in the avenue between the spectators as the spokesman repeating the message in a loud voice to the Basorum and his colleagues. The Basorum replies first, congratulating his majesty, wishing him a long life and prosperity. The other noblemen follow in a regular order. The Asipa being last, the chief of eunuchs, in like manner, repeats the congratulatory address to the Lord that over the sacrificial feast is now brought forward for the distribution about 40 dishes of stewed meat, 40 baskets of echo, 15 pots of beer, a bowl of two boiled yam, a large quantity of boiled corn. To these is added in the latter years, a demijohn of rum. The dahaha, or the king's taster, now steps forward with a rod in the right hand and a shield on his left, accompanied by his drummer. He first dances before the king and then retreats, taking with him his own portion, a basket of echo, a plate of meat, a pot of beer, one yam, one head of corn. He is to have a taste of each of these in the presence of the king and the concourse of spectators present, after which his followers may take away the rest of his portion. Next comes the Aloso, or the king's robber, playing the clown. He is dressed in a flowing garment, creeps about on all four, performing mimic acts of robbery of the amusement of to the for the amusement of spectators. After a few more amusement, the curtain drops, 
The rest of the dishes are cleared away into the dining hall where the Asipa, by virtue of his office, subsequently distributes them among the noblemen and their followers according to their rank. That of the Basoram king, one and a half of the whole. When the curtain rises again, the king appeared in more gorgeous robe with one crown on his head. His majesty now steps out of the Kobe with his staff in hand and walks towards the Ogigbo drum, stately, the majesty and the majestic and the basura comes dancing to meet him. All at once, the drums, thieves, and trumpets strike up a concert. The two rows of umbrellas move forward, meeting in the center to form a shady avenue uh, for the two august personages. The king stepping forward with measured treads to the sound of music and the basurum dancing and meeting him receiving with him one head of string cowries. This, however, is expected to be returned the next day, the apparent gift being merely a part of the ceremony. This usually ends the show, but the Bere Festival, the king continues to walk his right on the great entrance, then half around the quadrangle, giving the spectators a few view of himself then by one side door disappears into the inner precinct of the palace. The spectators thereupon disperse. These three festivals are concluded by a few Male Ilaris carrying sacrifices of certain quarters in the outskirts of the city in a state of perfect nudity, which is rather which is a rather trying time for them. There is always a rush of the women clearing out of their way on the approach of them, the performance of being symbolic of some religious rite. It is violated by any show of natural excitement. It must be atoned for, and there is but one penalty, decapitation. But there is no record of any such case occurring within a living memory. Their reward for this trying ordeal is that after their return, being properly dressed, they are admitted into the king's presence, who, sitting in state, receives them with marks of honor. This, end of cer this ends the ceremony of the festivals. But at the Bere season, one more ceremony remains, that known as the ceremony of touching the grass about Five, about 5.30 p.m. on that day appointed, the king issuing from the palace is accompanied by his slaves who have been engaged in piling into two or more heaps of bundles of bare grass scattered about in the area in front of the palace, placing those brought from the provinces. The piles are done up in an artistic manner, eight or 10 feet high in an open space away from any risk of fire. His majesty now steps forward and lays both hands upon his upon the heaps, making a short invocation of blessing of the Yoruba nation, congratulating himself for being spared to see another year. This brings the Berere festival to a close. The funeral of the king. Although the funeral of the king cannot properly be said to be one of the public appearances, yet it is considered more convenient to describe it in this place with other public ceremonies, which he is the center. The kings are buried in the bara. The funeral usually takes place at night. It is notified to the public by the sounding of the okenke in musical instrument like the bungle, the ivory trumpet and the koso drum, a drum which usually which is usually beaten every morning at 4 a.m. as a signal for him to rise from his head to beat 
it at night, therefore, is to indicate that he is retiring to his final resting place. The body is removed to the bara on the back of those whose office it is to bury the king, the kings, the chief of whom he is titled personage known as the Ona Onze Awa and his lieutenants. At certain stations on the route between the palace and the bara, 11 in all, they halt and emulate a man and a ram and also at the bara itself, four women, each at the head and at their feet, two boys on the right and on the left were usually buried in the same grave with the dead monarch to be, atten to be his attendants in the other world. And the last of all lamp bearers in whose presence all the ceremonies are performed. All of these practices, however, have been abolished, a horse and a bullock being used instead of human beings. The king is buried in black and white dress, but the crown on his head, the gorgeous robe with which he was laid out in the state and with which his course was decked to the bara and the bracelet on his wrists and ankles are never buried with him. These become the prerequisites of the Ana Onse Awa and his lieutenants. The bara in which the kings are buried is distinguished by its aloof situation from public thoroughfares in the outskirts of the city and having to it as many kobis as there are kings lying there, one being erected over each, the present bara enshrines the bones of the of King Oluero, the last of the ancient Oros, with those of the late king of the present. It is not open to the public. Several of the late king's wives are secluded here as in a coven and charged with the whole duty of taking care of their graves of their departed husband. Their mother superintendent is the Iyamode, generally styled Baba. She is the style because being entirely devoted to the worship of Shango, one of the earliest deified king, she is often inspired or possessed by the god and thus came to be regarded as the embodiment of the famous king. Additions are made to the number at every fresh burial, usually from among the favorites of the deceased husband. These women must all be celibate for life. Unfortunately, among the number are usually found some who are virgins and must remain so for life. Any misbehavior is punished with death of both culprits. The man on the day of the crime is detected and the woman after her confinement. Besides those who are immolated at the death of the sovereign, there used to be some honorable suicide consisting of certain number of the royal family, some of the king's wives and others whose title implies that they are to die with the king whenever that event occurs. With the title, they receive a badge of cloth known as a death cloth, a beautiful silk damask wrapper, which they usually array themselves with on a special occasion during the king's lifetime. Although the significance of this was well understood both by themselves and by their relatives, yet it is surprising to see how eager some of them are used to be to obtain the office with the title of the cloth. They enjoyed great privileges during the king's lifetime. They can commit any crime with impunity. Criminals condemned to death and escaping to their houses became free. These are never immolated. They are to die honorably and voluntarily. Of the members of the royal family and others to die were the Oremo or the crown king who practically reigns with his father enjoyed royal honors and has equal power of life and death. Three princes with hereditary titles, the Majaji, Iyaije, the Ogonpose, and the Alusami, two titled personages, 
not of royal blood, the Osi Wefa, the Olokun Ise, master of the horse, who is generally styled Ab Obaku, i.e., the one who is to die with the king, the female victims, Ia Oba, the king's official mother, Ia Naso, Ia Lakbon, the crown prince's mother, I La Mole, the Ifa priestess, the Oboram Ku Mefu, the Iya Molnari, the Iya Leori, these are all priestesses, and the Ore Ori Ite, the chief favorite. Will be observed that all of the above mentioned are those who, by virtue of their office, are nearest to the king at all times and have the easiest access to his person to make their life dependent on his, therefore, is to ensure safety for him against the risk of poisoning and the dagger of the assassin. The custom is that each should go and die in his or her own home among his family. The spectacle is very affecting, dress in their death cloth, they issue from the palace to their homes surrounded by their friends and the drummers beating funeral dirges, eager crowds of friends and acquaintances flocking around them, pressing near to have a last look at them as to say their final farewell as they march homeward. The house is full of visitors, mourners, and others, some in profuse tear, mournfully wailing, and funeral odes are heard on all sides enough to break the stoutest heart while the grave is digging the coffin making the parting feast is made for all of the friends and acquaintances and as they must die before sunset they enjoy themselves as best they can for that day by parting the choices and favorites favorite dishes appear several times in changes of apparel distributing present with lavish hand and making their last will disposing of their effects. When everything is ready, the grave and the coffin approved of, they, are, they then take poison and pass off quietly. But it, if it fails or it is too slow to take effect and the sun is about to set, the last office is performed by the nearest relative by strangling or otherwise to save themselves and the memory of their kin from indelible disgrace. The body is then decently buried by the relatives in the funeral of sickries perform. In many cases, voluntary suicides take place. Some of the king's favorite slaves who are not required to die often commit suicide in order to attend their master in the other world, expecting to enjoy equally the emoluments of royalty in their other world as in this. But these customs are now dying out with the age, with the age, especially since King Abita in 1858 abolished that the crown prince dying, the loss of experienced princes like that, like the Iyahan around the throne is also felt irreplaceable. With the exception of the women, all the men now refuse to die and they are never forced to do so, but they are superseded in their office if the next king wills it. They must then retire quietly from the city to reside in any town in the country in order to prevent the confusion of the two individuals bearing the same title. As the crown prince, he he expects to succeed his father on the throne, but if he is rejected by the kingmakers, he is also to retire from the city.